How's it? And welcome to Hot Tub Crime Machine. I'm your host, Kerry, and I'll be kicking it solo today for the first episode. I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and moved to Cape Town when I was about seven years old. And it was only really when I came to the UK about 15 and a half years ago that I became aware that the way we lived in South Africa wasn't normal. I mean, it was normal for me because it was all I knew, but I thought everyone had bars in their windows and security gates on their front doors and properties with eight foot walls decorated with razor wire. I mean, safety and security are pretty high up there in, in everything we do. And your neighbor gets a new gate and you know, you'll come over and have a look and, oh, that's, that's nice, that's a good one. I like that detail, it's nice and strong. Or your friend gets new alloys on, on, his, on his wheels and he's all like, yeah, hey, these cost me a fortune because I got those special lock nuts on them. Those robbing bastards are gonna have to take my whole car if they want these babies off my wheels. That type of thing. We, we used to leave our car unlocked eventually because you get sick and tired of people breaking your car windows just to have a look inside the car and then steal nothing. And it was no big deal when it happened. It was usually a phone call to your work to say, I'm gonna be late this morning. I've come down and my window's been smashed. So I need to go to PG Autoglass. On your way to PG Autoglass, you'd stop off at the police station and not to make a full report to launch an investigation to catch the thief. It's literally just to make the report and get the case number so that after you visit PG Autoglass, you can phone your insurance company, begin your claim. And it was literally nothing more than a massive inconvenience and a costly exercise in your life, but just another day. I mean, home robberies can also be a huge inconvenience, but obviously I mean the not serious kind of home invasion, the ones that happen when you go to work and you come home and they've broken in, they've tipped everything upside down, ripped out all your clothes out the wardrobes, flipped all the mattresses over, opened every drawer. I mean, that happened to us in 2001. The police attended and had a little look around and then asked us not to touch anything while we wait for the fingerprint people to come and dust for fingerprints. Well it's 2022 now and my parents are still waiting for them to come and dust for fingerprints. The police are overworked, overwhelmed, underpaid, many of them untrained. You rely more on private security companies to keep you safe, act and react when something is going on. You know we have armed response, panic buttons, one phone call away, nobody, or should I say, not a lot of people, and very rarely will you phone the police in a panic. It, it's always an armed response company, someone that you're paying for, someone your neighbor's paying for, someone you're paying for as a street, as a collective. However that happens, um, if you're fortunate enough to be able to have that, then the armed response is, is the ones who, who come out fast. The, the police really get involved, I would say, in my opinion is, is that it's it's after the fact. Once everything has happened and finished, I'm responsible for the police or you'll phone the police and they'll attend afterwards, take statements and look into investigating. Armed response can't do investigation. And then the police would get involved if, if we had to have case numbers or have investigations or get detectives out and take it take it further. But basically we rely on security companies and then you rely a lot on your own safety and doing your own things in the house to keep yourselves and your home secure. One year my sister and I went back to South Africa to visit our parents and they took us into the bedroom and showed us the new burglar bars. Everyone's standing around the window admiring them. They were made of some special plastic and were see-through which gave you the appearance that there were no bars on the windows and we, we all had to take turns to, to give them a tug and my dad's proudly encouraging us all to like pull as hard as you can and see if you can pull those off. Nobody's like devastated that, oh my God, I've got to put bars in my windows now. It's, it's more like, oh, how can I improve on my home safety? How can I make it look nicer, look smarter, look better? And it just is literally a thing that we do. It's normal, everyday interactions for South Africans. But then I do tell everybody the same thing. You have to go and visit South Africa. Don't let that type of thing put you off. Going there on holiday is completely different to living there. It's a place I think that everybody
everybody has to experience because Africa is unlike anywhere you'll visit. It really just stays with you. You leave a bit of yourself there and you take a little bit with you and you will often find yourself longing to be back there. It will always be my home no matter how many years I live in the UK. I will always refer to it as home and I'm so privileged to have grown up there and I would urge anyone to think about going to go. I mean if you have a chance to stand in the African sunshine, take it. You won't regret it. I mean don't get me wrong, don't be an idiot and do things you shouldn't be doing or go touring places you really shouldn't be touring with your GoPro attached to your head and fanny packs bursting with cash and your partner dripping in the family jewels because then you're asking for trouble. Stay safe, speak to locals before you go, get advice from people who've been and plan ahead. You will have the time of your life I can guarantee you that and when you come back you'll wonder why everybody goes on about it because when you went you had a lovely time crime in South Africa is a big part of life South Africans still living over there might not think as much but it really is and while there's a lot of general everyday petty crime because of the high poverty rate a lot of crime doesn't make any news or get any reporting but we have had our fair share of crime that makes the headlines and occasionally makes international headlines and the Oscar Pistorius shooting Riva Steenkamp is a good example of that but as Safis which is a slang term for South Africans abroad or South African far from Africa. As Safas, Karen and I really wanted to share a lot of crime stories out of South Africa, as well as telling you stories from around the world. But serial killers are the prime evil of evil in the crime and murder world. I know I certainly have a thing for serial killers. I mean, not a thing like I'm writing them love poetry in jail or anything or asking if I can visit them. I'm not like completely insane. Although to be fair, I do sometimes wonder what you would need to do to get granted visitation because I have so many questions I need to ask. But anyway, serial killers are both terrifying and fascinating. And while South Africa has quite an extensive list of serial killers, there's always one that stands apart from the rest for us. So I thought it might be good to kick off the first podcast with a story of South Africa's most famous or rather infamous serial killer who's still spoken about today in South African homes and everyone knows about them and how I think children are still doing school projects about them. I know I, I did a school project. So sit back and let me tell you the story of Daisy Demelka, South Africa's first female serial killer. But okay, wait, before I get into Daisy's story, let's have a quick look at South Africa's first ever documented serial killer. And this was a man by the name of Pierre Besson. Now, Pierre was born in 1880 and lived in Constantia, which is a suburb in Cape Town, South Africa. And from a young age, he was cruel and would torture animals for his own amusement. Hashtag serial killer red flag. But it would actually land up being greed that would drive Pierre to kill just around a dozen people over a three year period. To begin his spree, he actually picks a member of his own family, his very own brother, 17 year old Jasper. Pierre actually insured Jasper's life for around 3,500 pounds and he paid the first year's premium and then he invited his poor brother on a fishing trip to Gordon's Bay where Jasper sadly drowns. Now, you know, drowns in inverted commas. Pierre then collects on his brother's life insurance. This must most probably give Pierre a really good idea because he then goes on to run a scheme where he would lend money to people that needed a loan, but on one condition. And that was that the person borrowing the money had to make Pierre the beneficiary of their life insurance, you know, for just in case something would happen to them. But then Pierre would kill them bury them in his backyard, and then collect their life insurance. So between 1903 and 1906, it is believed that he killed eight or nine people at least. And when the police finally started figuring it out and arrived at Pierre's home to begin their investigation with a dig in his backyard, 
hope yes it is mom i'm just gonna go and get dressed for the police i've done nothing wrong and those were his last words because the moment the police dug up his first victim pierre blew his head off his shoulders case closed but now just over 520 miles to the east of where pierre lived in cape town and only a few short years after the removal of his head from his shoulders South Africa's first female serial killer was about to begin her crime spree with nearly an identical motive. The Daisy DeMalka case was South Africa's most sensational murder trial and attracted never seen before even local and international attention with articles in every local paper all the way to the New York Times. Daisy was infamous and even after her trial an entire generation would first grow up before another baby girl in South Africa would ever be named Daisy. On the 1st of June 1886, Daisy Louise Hancorn Smith was born in a town called Seven Fountains, Grahamstown, which is in Cape Town, South Africa. Her parents were both from England and they had arrived in the Cape and settled with a British Cape colony near Grahamstown. Now Daisy was the sixth of 11 children. There were seven girls and four boys. And in their colony, each family had a house with a small plot of land and Daisy's father farmed dairy cows on his little plot of land. Now, they weren't poor, but in their community, they didn't have any running hot water or electricity. But judging by the amount of children that Mr. and Mrs. Hancorn Smith, it's easy to see how they kept themselves entertained. But so with blue eyes and beautiful skin and very unmanageable hair, Daisy was a pretty child. She was born with a cleft palate, which is actually a split in the roof of the mouth that happens when the baby's growing in the womb. Tissues of the roof of the mouth don't fuse together correctly and this can cause like a hole in the palate or palate to be split in two altogether and it caused Daisy to have a slight issue with her speech. But she was a clever little girl. Not that being clever back then got you anywhere because if you were a woman, you were destined to be pregnant in a kitchen with an endless amount of children. And that was pretty much the future in the early 1900s South Africa. When Daisy was eight years old, her father and two oldest brothers went to go and see if they could make more money at the new British colony in Rhodesia, which we now know is Zimbabwe. And when she turned 10, rumors of a war between the Boer people and the British rulers Boer or the Boer is the Afrikaans word for farmer and they were classified as the white people who were descendants of the Dutch, German and French Huguenot settlers that arrived from the Cape in 1652. Basically the Boer had had enough of the British rule for various reasons and there were rumblings of war but that's a whole history lesson and we are not here for that. So Daisy is sent to join her brothers and her father on their farm in Rhodesia. She spends a few years there attending the school, that's especially for the farm children. But in 1899, when she's 14 years old, she goes back to Cape Town and is enrolled in a boarding school at the Good Hope Seminary. While she was there, the anticipated war actually did break out. Now, some will know this as the Boer War, but it can also be known as the Second Anglo-Boer War. A lot of people might know from their history lessons. I know I've seen at least two statues somewhere in the UK, two different places that actually had the war memorials dedicated to the British soldiers lost at the Boer War in South Africa. So probably UK side and South African side. It's a history lesson you might have already had. Moving on. Daisy stayed at the seminary for the entire duration of the war and in 1903, and now a 17-year-old young lady, Daisy goes back to Rhodesia. This is where she meets and falls in love with a rather dashing young man called Bert Fuller. He's an assistant commissioner of native affairs for the British Army, which basically just means that he supervised the indigenous people of that region. Now, he was paid really well with a very large pension pot waiting for him for when he retired. Now, he lived in rent-free government accommodation and he had a housekeeper, a cook, a gardener, and he had a car, which was huge back at that time because not nobody had cars. Bert actually proposed to Daisy, but she was not ready to settle down. 
She had her sights set on becoming a nurse, so she said bye-bye to Bert and headed to Durban, South Africa, and enrolled in a nursing school. After training for three years, Daisy then returned to Bert in Rhodesia. She wasn't finished training, but she couldn't resist being with him and probably being with the financial advantages that came along with him. And she finally accepts his marriage proposal and they set a date for the big day being the 2nd of March, 1907. Meanwhile, poor Bert gets transferred to a place near the Victoria Falls, which is on the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe, or Rhodesia. And it was not for the faint-hearted. There's sand, bush, thorn trees, and temperatures that soar over 40 degrees. It was definitely not for Daisy. She'd been staying with one of her brothers on his farm in Rhodesia, and had just been visiting Bert a few times at his new post. Bert had not been feeling very well and to be fair no one was really worried because someone was always sick with something because of where they stayed and the conditions that they lived in there was like malaria and tetanus and all sorts of funky fevers. So Daisy tells Bert that they really need to postpone the wedding until later in the year because she wants to go and get her nursing diploma and actually do some nursing before she's a married woman and has to settle down because married women back then didn't work and if they did work it was kind of seen as a sign that a couple was struggling with money. So it was quite natural for women to give up their lives when they said, I do. Anyways, Bert was okay with that and he told her he actually might come and join her in Cape Town and tells her that he's going to now prepare a will because he's going to become a husband and it's, you know, it's good to get all his affairs in order. Daisy hops on the train and she's quite relieved knowing that, you know, if anything happened to Bert, she would be the beneficiary of his will and she'll receive any money that he had in his pension from the British colonial office. So Daisy says goodbye to Bert and off she goes to Johannesburg where she's now enrolled into a new nursing school. But she's hardly even arrived when she receives a telegram from Rhodesia saying that Bert is in real bad shape and they don't actually think he's going to make it. So if she wants to see him and say goodbye to him, she needs to come back stat. She doesn't think twice and back on the next train, back up to Rhodesia she goes. So the doctors tell her that Bert actually has black water fever, which is a kidney disease and it's often a side effect from malaria. He's now delirious with a fever, his urine is black and on the 2nd of March 1907, the exact day that her and Bert had meant to get married the first time, Bert dies. Now, Daisy stays in Rhodesia for about three months and then returns to Johannesburg to resume her nursing training, complete her practical exam and actually begin her nursing career. So December arrives and she's about to begin working as a nurse, finally, and she receives a letter from a lawyer in Rhodesia regarding Bert's will. So back on the train and back to see the lawyer. Honestly, if this was the time of flying and Daisy flew, she would have had some serious Voyager miles by now. Back and forward on the train, no Netflix, no Spotify, who knows how they did it, but they did. Back on the train she goes and Bert's lawyer tells her that he's left her just under a hundred pounds in his will, which is quite a large amount of money considering that a married worker actually makes about four pounds per week. So if Daisy watched her pennies, then you know, this money could see her through quite a few months. Back she goes to Johannesburg on the train to start nursing and she's now staying with family and she's paying her own way. It's 1908. She's a 22 year old independent woman who don't need no man and she's fine. She's popular with the work staff as well as the patients and their families because, you know, she's had first hand experience when it comes to sitting at the bedside of her dying fiance. So, you know, she's, she's really able to empathize with the wives who are sitting at the bedsides of, of their dying husbands. And she's seen as extremely caring and empathetic to everybody. Now, during 1908, Daisy catches the eye of a Mr. William Alfred Cowell, who everybody calls Alf. Now, Alf is a 36-year-old male, and he comes from the Isle of Man in the UK. He was a plumber working for the Johannesburg municipality, and he was pulling in more than the average worker. So he's making just over seven pounds a week. And on the 3rd of March, 1909, one day after the second anniversary of Bert's funeral, Daisy and Alf tie the knot. 
In 1910, Daisy gives birth to a set of twins, which was a huge surprise back then because there was no way of telling how many babies you were carrying. I mean, my great-grandmother actually went into labor and gives birth to a baby boy. And a few minutes later, the nurse is now attempting to deliver what she thinks is going to be the placenta. My great-granny gives another big push and the nurse is all like, um, actually, it's another baby. Oh, yay. I wouldn't use the word surprise. I would actually go with shock and horror. I mean, imagine popping one out and the doctor's all like, oh, oh wait, <laughs> here's another one. No thanks, I need to know. I need to know what I'm in for. So anyway, yes, thank the baby Jesus that some doctor in Glasgow borrowed a sonar machine to see if he could monitor growing baby by chance. And um, that gave birth to the use of ultrasound, pardon the pun. And that was in the 1960s, but okay, let's move on. Sadly, these twins are premature and too weak to survive, and they both pass away quite early on. But not too long after the twins, Daisy's pregnant again. And in 1911, she gave birth to her pride and joy, which was a little boy named Rhodes Cecil. Now he wasn't the healthiest of babies either, but he survived. And three years later, they had another son called Lester. And two years after Lester, another son called Eric. However, at the age of four, Lester passes away from what is believed to have been an abscess on the liver. And then four weeks after Lester dies, Eric passes away. The cause of Eric's death, that one's unknown. Fast forward to 1922, Daisy is a stay-at-home mom to Rhodes, who's now 11 and very spoiled, and wife to husband Elf. He's now 49 and he's not in the best shape. He has always suffered with a bad back and now he's battling stomach issues after years of a South African diet that wasn't really agreeing with him. Now that consisted of fatty meats and very spicy stews, but growing up in the UK, his meals mainly consisted of boiled potatoes and herring fish which is you know not far from the fish and chips which the UK still thrives on today myself now included fish and chips battered not breaded dash of tartar sauce squeeze a lemon yes please anyway now Alf is having endless stomach issues and he now also because of his stomach issues has kind of gotten some hemorrhoids and a fistula let me tell you about a fistula if you don't know what that is brace yourself for a slight TMI so when you're constipated, which I can only assume ALF was, you're, mm, you're straining, let's call it straining, your straining causes the hemorrhoids. But then to add insult to injury, sometimes you can strain so hard that you just tear the inside of your bum hole. Now I know that's disgusting, but stay with me. The tear is just on the inside of your bum hole, and this is called a fistula. And every time you go toilet, you keep tearing it open again, because as you can imagine, a wound needs time to heal. So this one is a really tough one to heal because you can't not go to the toilet. So it's just a vicious cycle because you're so scared that you try not to go to the toilet, which makes you more constipated, which makes it harder to go, which causes the tearing to get worse. And we just go round and round. Now, I can tell you with confidence that this is the worst experience ever. That little tear happened to me when I had one of my babies and a long story short, I eventually plucked up the courage to go to the doctor for some help and she was all like, oh, I need to examine you and I was all like, oh, okay, if you have to. So she had to stick her pinky up my bum to see how big the tear was. I was mortified, she was mortified and long story short, she gave me cream to put on it. But honestly, the cream felt like I'd set my bum on fire with a blowtorch. It was horrendous. So yes, not loving that. Now back to Alf, who's constipated with a tear in his bum. In 1922, they obviously didn't have any fire bum cream because he gets admitted to hospital for surgical treatment for the hemorrhoids and the fistula. And on top of that treatment, he would also drink these mixtures that the pharmacist made up and he tried some old wives tales to attempt to cure his, his problems, but nothing was proving to make any difference whatsoever. He also wasn't sleeping very well, but he refused point blank to go back to any more doctors because he was not going to believe that a grown man needed to run off to the doctor because he couldn't sleep. He was a manly man and manly men don't complain about not sleeping. 
So in January 1923, Daisy finally convinces Elf to arrange to see a doctor from a private practice. And the appointment is on a Friday. But the day before, on the Thursday morning on the 11th of January 1923, he wakes up in absolute agony. He's got mad stomach cramps and Daisy's actually got to call the neighbors for help after he was literally delirious with pain. He's pouring with sweat, he's coughing, vomiting, screaming with pain from the constipation. So Daisy mixes her husband a drink of Epsom salts and actually helps him drink it. Now Epsom salts is a laxative in the form of like white crystals, which is a mixture of magnesium and sulfate. Daisy calls the doctor and tells him that he, he really needs to come urgently. And when he gets there, he examines Alf and gives him a prescription. But Alf would never be able to try the prescription because by the end of that day, Daisy was a widow. Alf, the father and husband, age 50, had died. The doctor that gave him that prescription refused to sign the death certificate before an autopsy is carried out. So the acting police pathologist actually performs the autopsy and declares his cause of death known as a kidney disease, Bright syndrome, which has caused bleeding on the brain. No foul play is suspected and a heartbroken Daisy buries her husband the very next day. Now dying on a Thursday was very inconvenient for Daisy because Elf's Friday paycheck was not going to be given to him. Her bank account is close to nothing. But luckily Daisy made sure that Elf had made a will and left everything he owned to her. So that figure was around £1,245 as well as a pension payout of around £550. And on top of these payouts, the house that had been bought had actually been bought in her name and that was nearly paid off. So Daisy would eventually be sitting pretty when it came to being financially stable cost of a two-bedroom house back then was roughly 300 pounds so Daisy had more than enough money to keep herself going for quite some time. Daisy wants to get back to work because she feels she needs to do something, needs to keep busy but because she hasn't been nursing for a good few years and all the changes that have happened in the nursing world she decides she's going to get a job as a porter in a children's hospital and was basically just pushing hospital beds back and forward, back and forward to the operating theatres. But as happy as she was to be working, Daisy had troubles of her own. Rhodes, the apple of her eye, now is 12 years old and he's not the brightest crayon in the box. And he's also developed epilepsy. So Daisy blames the lack of intelligence on his teachers at the school and she decides that the only solution to the problem was to send him to not only South Africa's most prestigious school but Africa's premier private school, Hilton College in Peter Marinsburg. He would attend the boarding school, of course, but it would totally be worth it because graduates of Hilton's college often went on to continue studies at universities like Harvard, Yale, Cambridge and Oxford. She paid a fortune for his school uniform, but unfortunately none of that made any difference because after a year he returned home without having passed one single exam. Daisy was not going to give up. She then sends him to the next top school, which was Maritz Brothers College. This school was actually close by to where they lived, but Daisy insisted that he was enrolled at the boarding school again because she felt he might have a better chance of learning something if he was with the other boys instead of home studying alone. This time Rhodes lost three years, but by age 16, not one diploma to his name. He then returns home and much to Daisy's delight, her last resort was to send him to a trade school so that he could learn to be a plumber, just like his dad. By now, Daisy is getting quite lonely. And if the rumors were to be believed, then Daisy was a lady in the street and a freak in the bed. She was good at the bedroom sports, if you will. So now she's looking for a man, not only to satisfy her needs, but to give her a hand with her little treasure, Rhodes, who was literally getting out of hand. He has no interest in studying or becoming a plumber, so she thought maybe a male influence might be handy in the house. Daisy is officially in the market for a husband, and she has her sights set on Robert Sprout. Bob, as he was known, was a 46-year-old man, also originally from England, and he had actually worked beside her poor departed elf in the Johannesburg municipality and was also a plumber. Now when they met, Bob was living his best bachelor life. 
he was also earning just over seven pounds a week and he was spending it all on himself. He had a wild dress sense. He took holidays to England to visit his mother and he even had a car. And like we said, a car was like, you know, that was big. On the 1st of July, 1926, Bob and Daisy get married. There's a 14 year age gap, but that doesn't bother Daisy because she knows he is older than her, but he will sign a will. And if anything happened to him, she would be the beneficiary. And as far as she knew, he had quite a healthy investment portfolio worth around 1,080 pounds. And if you added that to the savings and the pension pot, it would make Daisy very comfortable. Just with the portfolio alone, she could buy two large houses, which she could rent out and generate more income, you know, if she had to. So she knew that if she did lose Bob, she would be fine. Now it's not long before history begins repeating itself. Bob's digestive system was giving him trouble and he, you know, he saw a couple of doctors from the municipality health fund, but he loved an old wives tale. So he mixed up a remedy or two. And then just before their first wedding anniversary in 1927, Bob collapsed in agony, describing a pain in his side. And for the third visit in three days, he asks Daisy to go and get the doctor who diagnoses his pain as indigestion and he writes him a prescription. Next month, it happens again. And this time, Bob can hardly breathe. But again, the doctor writes a prescription for indigestion and he still has absolutely no relief. Daisy has to go and get a different doctor to the house and he took Bob's blood pressure and he diagnoses him with high blood pressure and coronary artery disease. That's the thickening of the blood vessels that carry the oxygen and the nutrients to the rest of your body and it restricts the oxygen to the organs. Bob is having none of it and after a few days in bed and a slight improvement in his health, he goes back to work. No man was admitting to high blood pressure or any weakness for that matter. Now on Saturday the 8th of October, Bob has had some dental work done and his mouth just won't stop bleeding. He's not sleeping very well and after a drive with Daisy, he goes up to the bedroom to rinse his mouth out and he passes out. Daisy is in a flat panic and she calls a doctor again for help. And this time Bob is having such bad spasms that he's screaming in pain. The doctor gives him an injection and he leaves but a while later he's called back again. He gives him another injection he leaves him another prescription. This lot love a prescription. Daisy then calls Bob's best friend, Billy. Billy is also a plumber. Everyone's a plumber. And Billy arrives at the house and relieves Daisy so that Daisy can leave and go and call Bob's brother, who actually stays about 34 miles away in Pretoria. He's William Sprout, and he's also moved from the UK to South Africa and not long after Bob. And William tells Daisy, right, he will be on the next train and he'll be in Johannesburg as soon as he can. And Daisy says, look, he's in a real bad way. I would be surprised. It would be a miracle if he was still alive by the time you get here. During the night, Bob was adamant he was dying. And to be fair, both Daisy and his friend Billy thought exactly the same. But as Bob lay dying, he tells Billy that he needs to make another will and he made Billy promise that he would tell everyone that, you know, it was his last wishes to leave everything to Daisy and that she was his only beneficiary. Because before this point, unbeknownst to anybody else, Bob didn't actually do anything about his will originally to get everything onto Daisy's name. So it's about 4 a.m. and his brother William finally arrives and Bob is going on and on about his last will and testament. He is deathly pale and he tells his brother to promise to make sure to tell all the relevant people that he was verbally changing his will and wanted Daisy to inherit everything. But on Monday the 10th of October, Bob seemed slightly better Daisy had fetched him a last will and testament form from inside the house and William helped him to fill it in and sign it. And after that, Daisy called a different doctor to the house who insisted that Bob does not take that prescription that the previous doctor had given him. He knew of a tonic that would give him all the energy he needed and the pharmacy would make it up for him. The very next day, that tonic works well, Bob gets up and goes to work. Another week passes, his brother returns to Pretoria, and then a month passes. Bob is feeling much better. He still has his slight digestive issues, but he was used to those by now. 
About a month later, on the 6th of November, Daisy and Bob go out for a nice Sunday drive. Apparently they loved a Sunday drive. And Bob starts complaining that he wasn't feeling very well. So he took some of his special tonic from the doctor and followed it up with a beer. Daisy's making some dumplings for lunch and while Bob is lying in the living room with all the windows and doors open because it's, it's a scorcher of a day, Rhodes actually walks into the lounge and shouts out for his mother to come quickly. Bob is pale and he has sweat pouring down his face. He's unresponsive and off Daisy goes to go and get the doctor again. Now the two doctors that usually see him weren't available so a different doctor attends and by the time he arrives the neighbor was over and she had actually helped Daisy get Bob into his pajamas because God forbid the doctor had seen him not in his pajamas in his bed and they get him into bed. The doctor takes one look at him and tells Daisy that Bob has most likely had a stroke and he was dying and it would probably be any minute now. When the doctor left the room, Bob actually died. Daisy was certain that he had died from a heart attack, but the doctor wasn't so convinced and wrote on the death certificate that Bob had died from coronary artery disease as well as a brain bleed. And once again, Daisy was a widow. But by now she knew the drill. She called the same undertakers that she used for her first husband. And two days later, on Tuesday the 8th of November 1927, Bob was laid to rest alongside Elf. And as the coffin was lowered into the ground, Daisy sobbed loudly with Rhodes beside her looking, you know, upset. But he, he managed to keep it together. Bob had left Daisy more money than Bert and Elf put together. She received a whopping £4,174, which was his share of his portfolio and his savings, and then an additional £566 from his pension payout. This officially made Daisy well off, as they described it back then. Half a year passed and Daisy decided to go on holiday to England for three months. And with Rhodes being unemployed again because he had failed his plumbing apprenticeship, he went along for the ride. The cruise liner took 12 days to reach Southampton from Cape Town and Daisy and Rhodes took up the offers that they'd received throughout the years of family members that said, you know, whenever you're here, come and stay with us, which is exactly what they did. She had also written to Bob's mother to let her know that they were coming to England and asked if they could come and see her. However, the grieving mother responded that she was in no financial state to be offering anyone hospitality. And to me, that sounded like a um, hashtag, my son is dead and you took all my money, bitch. So find your own place to stay, is pretty much how I read that. As Daisy and Rhodes made their way back to South Africa on the cruise liner, and coming with them was a motorbike that she had bought Rhodes in England. It would stand outside their house for everyone to see and Rhodes was always happy to take someone for a spin around the block if they'd asked. For about a year, Daisy was living the life of a grieving widow. She never went out, she never dated, did any partying and slowly but surely she began to run out of money. All her money from Alf and Bert was long gone now and Bob's money was running out fast and furiously and with Rhodes never being able to hold on a job it was not making the situation any easier especially that he was always drinking and asking her for money. He floated around jobs giving up after two or three months or was getting fired but he never told Daisy he, he would always tell her that the employers paid him off because they didn't have any more money so he had to go. He tried being a salesman, he did work as a plumber, even though he wasn't qualified as a plumber, and he worked on building sites doing the odd job here and there. They fought a lot and all the neighbours could hear all the shouting and pretty much knew that tensions were high in the household. Then at around Easter time in 1930, Daisy and Rhodes took a holiday together back to Rhodesia. Both her parents had now passed away, but her brothers and sisters were still living there. So Daisy and Rhodes stayed with them. They didn't like Rhodes at all, thought he was spoiled, rude and lazy, but you know, they loved Daisy and she was so kind and caring. And when they arrived back from their holiday, Rhodes got a job and Daisy was delighted. Finally, he was making his way. He was going to repair cars and trucks for the government of Swaziland. He thought because he liked to fix his bike at home, it gave him the idea that he could fix cars and trucks, which he couldn't, but off he went and tried in any case. 
He wasn't qualified, so he was earning under four pounds per hour, which was not a good wage at all. Daisy made the trip out to see him twice, and each time she took him gifts and cookies that she'd made especially for him. But each time he would ask her for money, and she would give it to him. Then they would argue about what he was spending his money on. And the second time she went to visit him, she took him a last will and testament form, and she told him that he needed to make a will. Daisy explained to her son that no man should ever die intestate and he should always have a will. Then in 1930, Daisy was getting lonely again and wanted a husband to share her life with. So she was hoping to find someone who was also lonely and looking for a wife. And she managed to find just the man. Sidney, or Sid as they called him, was Sidney Clarence Demelka. His nickname was Sloppy Demelka. And in Afrikaans, sloppy means a small sleep or a nap. And he got this nickname because his, his sleepy eyes made it look like he was always about to fall asleep. Sid, now 46 years old, used to be famous because in 1906, at the age of 22, he was a Springbok rugby player and toured the British Isles with the South African rugby team. But now, after 24 years, there were not many people who knew his name except Daisy, she remembered his name. There was no surprise to find out that Sid, like Alf and Bob, was also a plumber and he actually worked at a gold mine. And as a widower, Sid shared his home with his 19-year-old daughter, Eileen, who was an only child and she was actually studying to become a teacher. So Eileen and Daisy would meet in passing and exchange the nice hellos and you know nothing more than that. And one day in passing, they ran into each other again. And this time, Sid was with his daughter. He didn't know Daisy, but he knew of Daisy because she was known as the poor widow who had no two dying husbands. And with Sid also being lonely, it was literally a matter of days until him and Daisy had become an item. One year later, on the 21st of January, 1931, and on a roasting hot Wednesday afternoon, Daisy and Sid were married. Daisy, now 45, and Sid, 47, both looked vastly different how they looked in the few years prior. Their ages were definitely showing. Daisy's hair was more out of control as ever. She was actually breaking combs when trying to brush out the knots in her hair. And it had also started to go quite gray. Rhodes and Eileen, both 20 years old at this time, were both present in church on the big day, but they didn't like each other. Um, even before their parents got engaged, they did not get on with each other at all, so that was probably a slightly awkward church service. Eileen had told her father that Rhodes was a dimwit and he looked dangerous, and Rhodes told his mother that Eileen was a busybody and would definitely make trouble in the new marriage. But despite the feeling of the children towards each other, Daisy moved in with Sid and Eileen, and she was happy to do so. The house she owned had sold really fast, and Daisy made sure that when her and Sid got married, they signed a marriage contract that stated whatever was hers was hers, and whatever was his was his. So she knew that if anything happened to her, she could leave Rhodes the money from the house in her will. After three months of marriage, Rhodes arrives back at the new family home. He had left his job, but Sid, Daisy and Eileen all knew that he'd probably been fired from it. And now with Rhodes in the house, everything started to become clear that their happy life in the cottage was not going to be very happy. Rhodes fought with Sid and Daisy and then argued with Eileen and he'd even hit her once. But Rhodes was not doing very well. He was suffering from some stomach cramps, vomiting and diarrhea. And Daisy feared that his epilepsy would start up again after going away for quite a while. Now Daisy was no stranger to death and she knew it was just a part of life but she felt comforted in the knowledge that Rhodes had signed his last will and testament and as his only beneficiary she would inherit everything he had. By this stage the only thing Rhodes did have was an insurance policy that her and Alf had taken out for him when he was 11 years old. One day Rhodes was so ill that Daisy had to call the doctor to come to the cottage and the doctor diagnosed him with malaria which Daisy said he must have caught in Swaziland because it was absolutely rife over there. The doctor left his usual prescription and Daisy assured the doctor that she would get it collected and make sure to nurse him and give him all the care he needed because after all she was a trained nurse and as well as her nursing experience she had nursed two dying husbands. 
For three weeks, Daisy never left Rhodes' bedside, and it showed because he began to make a great improvement. He was now able to get out of bed, sit in the warm sunshine in the garden, and he slowly began to feel so much better that he went out and managed to find himself a job. He was driving a dry cleaning truck and then was quickly fired for being rude to everyone. He got another job fairly quickly after that, repairing cars again, but that didn't last long either because he started fighting with the guys he worked with as well as the customers. At home, Rhodes was just as angry and bitter, and one day, out of a fit of rage, he took an axe to his motorbike, and everyone, including his neighbors and his relatives, feared that Rhodes was actually losing his mind. He then hit Daisy one day, who told him in front of everyone that she had forgiven him because she is his mother. He then began to lose a lot of weight, got really depressed, and spoke a lot about taking his own life. On the 2nd of March 1932, Rhodes didn't come home after work because he decided that he was going to try and play rugby, just like his Springbok stepfather, and he went to practice after work. It was now after 8pm when Rhodes finally got home, and then he went back out again with some friends. The next morning, he got up and he was yellow, but he said he was feeling fine and he went off to work, but it wasn't long until he was back home again, feeling unwell, and climbed back into his bed. On Friday the 4th of March, Rose tells Daisy that he's not feeling very well so he can't get out of bed and he cannot go to work and asks her to please phone the doctor to come and see him. The doctor came over and said that Rhodes had had the stomach flu and, you guessed it, gave him another prescription. Daisy made sure that he took his medicine but he spent the day vomiting and sweating and having diarrhea and Daisy stayed by his side feeding him his soup and practically carrying him back and forth to the bathroom and making sure he was comfortable. The next day Rhodes was much worse and needed to use the bedpan. A neighbor actually spoon fed him brandy that Daisy had brought in for him. By this time he had stopped eating and drinking so Daisy had to hold his mouth open while the neighbor forced the spoon into his mouth. Daisy was not happy with the first doctor's diagnosis so she called another doctor in and he happened to be the same doctor that did the autopsy on Elf back in 1923 when he died. This doctor gave Rhodes chloroform to ease his pain. His stomach cramps were so severe that the doctor had one main aim and that was just to ease the pain. Finally Rhodes drifted off into a deep sleep and late that morning the first doctor that had attended decided to stop by and see how Rhodes was doing. But Rhodes didn't wake up. The doctor gave Rhodes an injection and then left. Later that afternoon, it had become clear to Daisy, Sid, Eileen and all the neighbors who had come to see Rhodes that he was now in a coma. And while they all stood by his bedside, Rhodes, age 20, took his last breath and died. When Daisy called for the doctor to come and issue the death certificate, the doctor refused and wanted to perform an autopsy because Rhodes' illness made him feel a bit unsettled. His body was taken to the state morgue where the autopsy was then performed and Daisy was actually told that the cause of death was cerebral malaria, which actually needs to be treated within 24 to 72 hours, otherwise it is fatal. Daisy arranged the collection of Rhodes' body and arranged the funeral and she wanted Rhodes to be buried on top of his father at the grave, giving her peace of mind that all her loves were together. One month later, in April, Daisy received the check from the insurance company for Rhodes for £100 and had Rhodes not died, he would have inherited the £100 on his 21st birthday. Daisy also went and visited Rhodes' place of work to collect his wages for the days that he'd worked in the last week of his life and a total of 15 shillings was handed to her by the owners, an amount that would buy maybe one week's milk and meat. Meanwhile, William Sprout, the brother of Bob, was sitting at home in Pretoria reading the newspaper, checking up on the news of the Lindbergh kidnapping in America, which is a whole other crime story. And he paged over to the local events and he cast his eye down over the advertising columns and he suddenly noticed the death announcement of a 20-year-old man by the name of Rhodes Cecil Cow, the son of Daisy DeMelka. This news did not sit right with them. 
Her son had just died five years before his brother died while married to Daisy. Her first husband died and he also knew that over a period of a few years, four of her children had died. After thinking about this for some time, William decides that he has to go and see the police and he makes his way to the Department of Criminal Investigation in Pretoria and he explains everything to the inspector. He goes right back to her fiance, Bert Fuller. He explains her first husband, her children, her second husband and now her son and he tells the inspector that his family was deeply disturbed about how she behaved at the graveside of his brother and that while his brother was being lowered into his grave, she had actually turned to her friend and said that she was concerned at the possible state of a bird that she had left cooking on the stove while they were here at the funeral. He told the inspector that she was currently married to the South African rugby player and that he was concerned that if Daisy was not stopped then something might happen to Mr. Demelka or even to his 20 year old daughter. The investigator sent this statement straight to Johannesburg to the detective constable J.C. Janssen and he was assigned to the case. Now once he read through these details, Janssen recalled that a few days before Rhodes had died, he had actually informed the police that his motorbike had been stolen. So Janssen went and spoke to the officer that investigated the theft and he tells him that he arrived at the property on the Monday following the death, unknowing that the death had taken place. He knocked on the door and asked to speak to Mr. Rhodes' cow and Daisy had replied, he's dead, he died on Sunday and he was buried yesterday. Janssen asked if the mother had seemed upset and he said no, not in the slightest and even when he left he thought to himself she didn't even seem like a mother who just buried her son. Janssen then takes himself over to the registrar to find out the cause of death on the certificate and when he finds out that the cause of death was not clear and required a post-mortem, the registrar also tells Janssen that Daisy had also been in to get the results and been told that Rhodes had died from cerebral malaria. Next stop for the detective was the surgeon that did the post-mortem. Janssen tells the doctor that this needs to stay between them. This is confidential and he asks him to keep the visit to himself because it's a police investigation. He asks the doctor if he was satisfied with the cause of death being cerebral malaria. And surprise, surprise, the doctor tells Janssen that he was actually very puzzled by the entire case and that he is still puzzled by it. He also told Janssen that Daisy wished to avoid the post-mortem and kept asking him why it was necessary. Armed with this information, Detective Janssen decides that he's going to do a full investigation into Daisy's past and investigate the series of tragedies that seemed to happen around her. Janssen found out that in the lead up to Rhodes's death, he'd actually been having quite a few arguments with his mother and it seemed to center around the idea that Rhodes had thought he was going to inherit part of the substantial estate that his father had left when he died and he would get this money when he turned 21. Daisy had told him that that was under no circumstances going to happen and Rhodes had apparently unleashed his rage on his mother, called her quite a few choice names and so much so that the new stepdad had to step in and have some serious words with Rhodes for being so disrespectful to his mother. Detective Janssen then went to the doctor that issued Bob Sprout's death certificate and asked him what he would think that the opinion that Bob could have been poisoned. The doctor told Janssen that he would not be in the least bit surprised if that was the case and said that although the death had been put down as natural causes, he felt that the symptoms leading up to his death looked like strychnine poisoning. Now strychnine is a highly toxic, colorless, bitter alkaloid that's used as a pesticide, mostly for killing small birds and rodents, and if inhaled, or swallowed or absorbed through the eyes or the mouth, it can cause poisoning which results in muscular convulsions and eventually death through asphyxia. But the doctor went on to tell Janssen that he didn't suspect that anyone would have actually poisoned him. Janssen, who's now on a roll, heads to see the doctor that attended Alfred Carroll's bedside and he struck gold there because the doctor said that the fit that Alfred had had that killed him looked very much like strychnine poisoning. He then went on to tell the detective that when he ordered the post-mortem, he gave instructions that the Epsom salts bottle needed to be turned over to the police for inspection because he was actually convinced that the salts might accidentally have contained poison. So when Janssen asked the doctor how that all ended and why that didn't get done, he said that another doctor who didn't know about the initial observations actually did the post-mortem and he signed the death certificate as chronic nephritis and a brain hemorrhage. 
armed with all the information from the doctors, the detective goes back and looks at the financial history of the cases and he soon discovers the amounts of money Daisy's inherited from the first husband and then the second. And he also finds a witness that tells him that Daisy had practically forced Bob Sproat to sign a will while he was literally in agony having violent fits on his deathbed. The financial digging went right back to Bert Fuller in 1909 when Janssen discovered that Daisy had persuaded Bert to make a will and to name her his sole beneficiary. Convinced that Daisy has poisoned two of her husbands and her own son, all that's left to do now is for Janssen to find Daisy's poison source. This would be something that the case would rely heavily on as evidence if it were to go to court. So Janssen and the other detectives search every pharmacy in and around that region but come up with absolutely nothing. After continuing for a month working behind the scenes to find the poison supplier, Janssen eventually decides that he can't do anything else until Rhodes' body and, if needed, the bodies of the two husbands need to be exhumed and re-examined. But you can't just start digging people out the ground, even in the 1930s, so Detective Janssen puts together a case for the Attorney General and really hopes it'll be strong enough for him to grant the order. He hands the order back to him on the 11th of April and three days later, Janssen gets the go ahead. And on the evening of the 25th of April, a group of officers sneak into the cemetery and open the graves of all three men. Three days after the body is examined, Janssen gets the call to say that the cause of death for Rhodes is arsenic poisoning. It's been found in his hair, his spine and all of his organs. This is the point where Janssen decides that it's time to go and visit Daisy and confront her with all the information he has. So he drives to the cottage where Daisy lives with Sid and he takes with him the examining doctor, three other detectives as well as a female prison warden. He parks the car a little bit away from the house and Janssen and the junior detective walk towards the house and as they're approaching they see Daisy looking at them through the fly screen. So Janssen shouts over, can we see you for a moment Mrs. Demelka? And Daisy pushes open the door for them and they step inside. Janssen introduces himself and informs Daisy that he had a warrant for her arrest on the charge of murder. She stands staring dead straight at him and turns away and took herself to the dining room and sat down at the table. Murder, she repeats to him, and, and who did I murder? So Janssen says that the allegation against her is that she murdered her son by administering arsenic. Up she jumps and shouts, how can you accuse me of that? To which Janssen calmly informs her that they have dug up Rhodes's body and found arsenic in it. She then shouts out to her cousin in the next room and she's all, Mia, they've come to arrest me. They say I've murdered Rhodes. Mia lives close by and she'd been having tea with Daisy that morning and she tells Daisy that the police must be crazy. But Janssen assures them both that they are not crazy and he tells Daisy that they're going to search the house. He even gives her the opportunity to confess and hand over the arsenic because he asks Daisy if she cares to make the search unnecessary. She just laughs at him and says she has absolutely no idea what they think they're talking about, but she can't believe that they would think that she's killed her own son. The house is searched, but nothing is found, and Daisy is arrested and taken away. And at every interview, she laughs in their faces when police detectives try to break past her outraged, innocent act. Daisy is then formally charged and driven to the Fort Prison in Johannesburg and booked into the women's prison. Detectives know that they are not going to get anywhere without finding where that poison has been purchased and once again they go out through the entire area and this time with a handwriting sample to compare on all the pharmacies poison registers. The next day the story is printed in all the papers and the public were outraged that a woman could commit these crimes for financial gain and that a mother could kill her own son for a hundred pounds. After reading the story in the newspaper, a co-worker of Rhodes's actually came forward, a Mr. James Webster, and he said that there was one day while working with Rhodes that he'd been really sick with stomach pain, and it happened to be on the very same day that Rhodes had become ill with obviously whatever had killed him. The police took hair and nail samples from James which came back positive for arsenic poisoning. So he gave a statement on that day that Rhodes had taken a blue flask of coffee to work with him and that his mother had made the coffee for him on that day and he happened to drink a cup of Rhodes' coffee. The police then returned to the house and found three flasks, one of which was blue and when they tested it, it came back with positive traces of arsenic. But police hit their big break 
when a pharmacist from a few towns away came forward and said that he recognized Daisy from the newspaper as the woman that he sold arsenic to in the February. She arrived to see him at the pharmacy and told him that she had a problem with stray cats and wanted to put some arsenic down to kill them, which apparently was quite normal back then and I have so many questions about dishing out arsenic and throwing it all over the floor. But anyway, I guess the 1900s were just, you know, a bit wild. They were still trying to figure out what was and was not acceptable to sell over the counter. Anyway, the pharmacist was able to provide proof that Daisy had signed the poison register, but she signed it under her maiden name, Mrs. Sprout, and she'd also given a false address. Facing a triple murder conviction, Daisy's trial eventually began on Monday the 17th of October 1932 and if found guilty, she was going to face the death penalty. Now the story had made national and international attention, so there were queues of people outside the court and police were there holding back the crowd as Daisy arrived, giving a cheeky smile to the cameras and with her wild grey hair and a bob and no makeup and she wore a black dress and she would actually go on to wear the same dress for the entire duration of the six week trial. With her head held high she played the role of the posh wife and mother and this act also remained throughout the entire six week trial. She told Sid that there was absolutely no doubt she was going to be acquitted and said to him that even an idiot could tell that there would be no court in the world that was going to find her guilty with such pathetic evidence. I mean a poison register kept by some worn out old pharmacist and a blue flask. Sid couldn't bear the thought of losing his wife who was totally convinced of her innocence because I mean why would she be nursing her dying son it didn't make any sense she was trying to make him live and why would she do this when she was actually trying to end his life now Daisy chose a trial by judge and two assessors as opposed to a trial by a jury because her lawyers told her that the public was so against her and there would be no doubt at all that all 12 would sentence her to death without even stopping to think about it. Her lawyers also believed that the case against her was so strong that there was no point in trying to go on with a not guilty plea because they were better off begging for leniency of a life sentence instead of the death penalty. Now, about 60 witnesses were called by the state and under 30 were called for the defense. One of the defense character witnesses actually described Daisy as a, as a conscientious homemaker with a fondness for baking. Yes, Maureen, and killing. Baking and killing, and killing with her baking. Now, her lawyers tried to convince the judges that Rhodes had actually taken his own life, and although the court could prove that Daisy purchased the poison, there was actually no proof that she put the poison into any of his food. Rhodes had been so depressed, and he spoke often about ending his life, and he could have just taken it himself. The duration of the trial was anything but boring with Daisy often shouting liar to the witnesses on the stand and, and when she was cross-examined by the prosecutor she insisted she was innocent and insulted anyone and everyone in the courtroom. But on Friday the 25th of November with the sun scorching down in the courtroom the doors opened and the people who had queued all night for the best seats in the house went straight in and straight back out again to then sell their seats for up to 30 shillings. And when I tried to find out what a shilling was worth Google told me that it was about £1.50 in today's money so all in all it would be like buying a seat for around £45. It was packed and people were making money for the front seat of her sentencing. Now the judge ruled that the state did not manage to prove without reasonable doubt that Elf and Bob had died of strychnine poisoning and that the two murder charges against her for them were dropped for insufficient evidence. And then silence fell over the courtroom when the judge stood up to pronounce the verdict. Daisy Demalka, do you have anything to say before I pass sentence for the murder of Rhodes Cecil Cowell? To which she replied, I am not guilty of poisoning my son. The judge then continued, I can pass only one sentence. Daisy Demelka, I find you guilty of poisoning your son, Rhodes Cecil Cowell, which would cause his death. You will be taken from here to a place of your execution where you will hang by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. Daisy went white as a sheet and then was escorted out of the courthouse and driven back to the woman's prison at the Fort Prison Complex, where she was told to pack her bags and was then taken to the Pretoria Central Prison, which was South Africa's hanging prison. 
on the 30th of December, 1932, Daisy DeMalca, aged 46, hung for her crime. After her death, her defense attorney wrote in his autobiography that Daisy was suspected of having poisoned several other people in addition to the ones that she was charged for and that the cases had been investigated by the Rhodesian police at the time of her trial. They had even sent the Rhodesian authorities to Johannesburg for the duration of her trial just in case she was acquitted so that they could arrest her on their own charges. Capital punishment was abolished in South Africa on the 6th of June 1995, which came as a huge relief to the 453 people still on death row, whose sentences were then commuted to life in prison. Sid, the old springbok, would go on and marry twice more. Now to me, Daisy doesn't seem to have gotten her kicks out of killing people. It was almost as if they just irritated her, or got in the way, or she needed money, so they needed to leave. Rhodes obviously wasn't towing the line, didn't do what she thought he should be doing, was making more of a nuisance of himself than anything else, so he then obviously had to go in the end. I keep wondering to myself about her children. I understand that her twins were born premature and most probably died in infancy, but I can't help but wonder if her other two sons had fallen fate to a mother that probably just couldn't be bothered with half the pain and suffering that they had caused her, so she would in turn do the same and just get rid of them. Or did she have this bizarre need to want to nurse people back to health and then make them ill again and nurse them back to health? But money seemed to be quite the motive for Daisy and the last will and testament seemed to definitely be the calling card before the crime. But in Daisy's day, the death rates were much higher with so many people being really unwell from all sorts of diseases. So it was fairly easy for some deaths to go unnoticed. Poisons were cheap and easy to get your hands on and it would have been nothing to slip it in a flask or mix it in with some Epsom salts or roll it into some dumpling dough. Basically, everyone was shitting themselves for some other reason back then. So there was no real suspicion ever cast over Daisy until her son died. But when it all came out, the country and it seemed like the world was completely shocked. The wife was meant to obey her husband and be the family maker. And Daisy was a white, English-speaking, middle-class woman who had no problem finding new husbands. So the thought that a mother and a wife had done something like this was unspeakable. To be fair, you know, if I was elf with my fistula and my hemorrhoids and there was no fire bum cream and I had to have surgery to get any relief, then I think I would have been begging Daisy to put me out of my misery. Screw the laced Epsom salts, Daisy, just smother me with a pillow and I'm good to go. Daisy is a popular myth in South Africa and even nearly 90 years after her execution, she's referenced in daily life. Growing up, I knew who she was and what she did and she was literally a household name. If you had messy wild hair, the old people will say, oh, you look like Daisy DeMalka. Or if the wind blew a door shut, they would say, oh, it's Daisy DeMalka's ghost. Even today at the hospital where Daisy was a porter, there's a rumor that her spirit haunts the children's ward and the staff have seen her ghost walking the halls. And it's even said that She's been seen standing beside the bed of a sick child who would then later go on to die. And if you knew somebody who had two or three husbands die, then it would be a common inside joke that she was another Daisy DeMalka. But Pierre and Daisy were both active at the start of the insurance industry, where authorities were not expecting or even thought about a kill to claim case. And what are the chances that the first and second serial killers, or the first male and the first female serial killers, both unaware of each other, had insurance fraud as a motive? I mean, it was literally death by life insurance.